great to um, it's great to see you again, and I hope that I'll be able to um, come and visit you and and speak again if you want me to uh, in person uh, pretty soon. It's been really a couple of years before I, since I've been to New York, um, but I hope to be able to come back and resume uh, that sort of guest lecture stuff that I used to do before. Um, thanks very much for asking me to speak also about this, and I, I hope you won't mind. I doubt if you will, but I'd like to really offer a sort of initial contrarian uh, opinion on this. I don't dispute that what's been called the civil society space is shrinking, um, but I think it sort of depends on where you measure that from. Um, those of us who are old enough to remember before about 1990, um, I th think for some of us at least, things really don't look that bad today. Uh, compared to the 1970s and 80s. Absolutely, I understand if your adult memory begins in the mid-90s, things look awful now by comparison, because they are. But if you do remember uh, the 70s and 80s, as, as I do, um, there were viable threats of uh, nuclear war during the, the Cold War. All of Eastern Europe um, lived under the Soviet Union. Most of Latin America uh, lived under military dictatorship. Um, South Africa. I'm afraid was run by the racial segregation of uh, apartheid uh, and things were really pretty dismal. Now I know exactly how bad things are right now too. I was in Ukraine myself last week talking to human rights defenders. Um, I know that we are on the brink of something even worse perhaps than we're seeing in Europe already but you know we have been through i would say worse than this the human rights movement and human rights defenders have been through worse than this in the 1970s and 1980s and things really did improve drastically around the early 90s and yes i agree that they have nosedived since then but i still don't think they're as bad as they were you know you look at europe even western europe during the 70s and 80s and the generals were running uh, greece and spain and you know, I'm Irish and look at what's happening in the north of Ireland during the 70s and 80s and 90s. And we're nowhere near as bad as that. Uh, so I'd like to get a little bit of a longer term perspective into this, uh, if we could, uh, if only to offer a ray of, of optimism that, you know, we're not doomed. Right. Things looked terrible uh, towards the end of the 80s. And frankly, as I remember them, you know, there was no imminent prospect of a sudden upsurge uh, in improvement. And yet it came. You know, in February 1982, a young guy, 21, I think he was, called Chris Dufroy, uh, tried to cross the Berlin Wall um, in a balloon and, and, and he was shot down and killed uh, in February 89 because he, knew, he saw no prospect during his lifetime of the Berlin Wall collapsing. And the guard who shot him uh, was given a medal. If he had waited, another eight months, he would have been able to walk across into West Berlin with tens of thousands of other people. And yet there was no way of knowing that that was about to happen. Um, the, the title of, of my remarks tonight are the, the uh, slowly and suddenly. And, and I, I think that's how change happens. You know, the Berlin Wall came down because human rights defenders uh, in East Germany and elsewhere uh, helped to foment dissent against the government for generations. And then when it happened, it happened amazingly quickly. You know, the, the, the phrase slowly and suddenly comes from uh, an Ernest Hemingway uh, novel, The Sun Also Rises, which I think is, is 99 years old now. And there's a character in there called, um, uh, called Mike, and he's a gambler and he goes bankrupt. And one of the other characters says to him, how did you go bankrupt, Mike? And he said, two ways slowly and suddenly. And I think that's how political change happens. I think that's often the change that human rights defenders manage to make. It happens over a long grind. I mean, we're not talking months and years, we're talking decades and decades and sometimes generations. When apartheid fell, it, I, I would argue, you know, it, it, after, after many people had worked for, uh, for 40 years for its downfall, it's the sort of death knell happened in a, in a 28 minute speech um when the when the president of south africa sort of realized and publicly admitted the game was up when the berlin war felt it happened really in a matter of days 
for those of you, I guess, are more many more of you can remember what happened at the end of 2010 and early 2011 uh, in the Middle East. But when those uprisings happened in Tunisia, and then there was a contagion across uh, much of uh, of the Middle East, North Africa, you know, from 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 Tunisia then to Egypt and Bahrain and, and Libya and and Syria and elsewhere. There, there was there was no warning that those things were going to happen and yet they happened because of decades of 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 dissent and activism by human rights defenders and others so um i i, I don't want, i don't want to take my full time at all because i'm much more interested in the uh, in the question and answers and the discussions here but I'd say when we're talking about the, the shrinkled civil society space, please let's have a longer perspective than what's happened in the last 10 or 20 years. In the last 10 or 20 years, we have become much better at counting and measuring how bad things are. So when you look at whether it's Global Witness or Frontline Defenders, for instance, um, publishing annual figures on the number of human rights defenders who are killed every year. And, you know, that number... You know, because of actually, I think mainly uh, better documentation, that number tends to rise from, you know, the 270s to the 290s up to the 320s. That doesn't necessarily mean that more human rights defenders are being killed these years than they were five years ago or even 50 years ago. God knows human rights defenders were being murdered 50 years ago. But there, was, there weren't NGOs there who were accumulating that data and publishing it. So the, the statistics on how bad things are getting uh, is very valuable to have, but you know the baseline just wasn't there 30 and 40 years ago, and yet we know of the gulags in the Soviet Union, and we know of the the the, the prisons across China, uh, not just now, but 40 and 50 years ago, and the numbers of human rights defenders who were killed and imprisoned 40 and 50 and, and 80 and more years ago uh, may well be at least as bad and possibly worse as they are now. So when we go into this discussion, uh, which I think is a very useful one, because I, I think that the use in this is how do we stop uh, the, the, the closing of the space for human rights defenders and how do we better protect and support them? And I also think there's grounds for optimism there, because I think um, many states have realized that there are ways that they can help human rights defenders uh, and are doing that. But I think let's not let's not paint ourselves into a depressing corner where we say things are really getting bad year on year and decade on decade. Maybe, maybe if you're only going back three decades, but if you want to go back to four and five and six decades ago, actually, I think we're in a much better position than we were in those days. Okay. I'll leave it there for now and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Brian. Nikhil, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Nikhil's remarks are entitled Civic Freedoms as Collective Defense. Thanks so much, George. Um, thanks to all of you for being here. And thanks, Brian, for those uh, really insightful remarks. It's, it's not very often that you get to hear in, in this community sort of a more long-term and positive assessment of where we are and where we're going, which I think is incredibly helpful. What I would like to, so my name is Nikhil Dutta. I'm a legal advisor at the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, as George said. And what my organization does is we try to work to improve the enabling environment for civil society around the world. We try to promote um, an environment in which individuals can exercise the core civic freedoms. I'll talk a little more about that in a second. Um, and what I'd like to discuss today is just the ways in which um, protection for human rights defenders specifically is intimately related to the broader environment for civil society and the broader environment for the exercise of civic freedoms, which I hope also points to the ways in which by trying to promote a, a more enabling environment for civil society generally, that we can also try to promote the protection and, and a safe environment for human rights defenders to, to do their all important work. Now, as, as Brian said, the, the data is certainly not, um, is not very optimistic. The, the numbers that we have on the number of human rights defenders, for instance, who are killed each year, as Brian said, is going up each year. Um, I believe last year, the Human Rights Defenders Memorial um, investigated and verified 358 killings of human rights defenders. And physical attacks on human rights defenders, of course, are only the most extreme type of threat that human rights defenders may face. 
um, frontline defenders just by assessing the request for emergency assistance that they received in 2021 identified the most common types of threats that human rights defenders faced in their sample. And those were arrest and detention, including for participating in peaceful protests, uh, threats and harassment, including online harassment, especially of women human rights defenders, um, hacking and cyber attacks, including to steal information in order to carry out blackmail or public humiliation of human rights defenders, um, legal actions such as criminalization, which can be based on counterterrorism laws, national security laws, defamation, and an array of other um, bases, um, and surveillance. As, as we saw from the revelations around the Pegasus project, um, uh, the sale of surveillance technology to governments around the world has enabled closer surveillance, digital surveillance of activists, human rights defenders, and has enabled further threats to them. So we have this array of threats that are specifically facing human rights defenders, which as it may have changed um, sort of in a specific dimensions, but I think as Brian usually stated, uh, it's, it's always been quite dangerous to try to engage and work to promote human rights um, in many places around the world. Um, and, and another point to note is just the prevalence of stigmatization and smear campaigns that are targeting those who are working to pro promote human rights. So what I would like to talk about is how that fits into the broader sort of picture we're seeing with respect to the environment for civic freedoms. So when we talk about civic space, what we're talking about is the, the whole environment, you know, the political environment, social, legal, economic environment that allows individuals to act either collectively or individually on matters of public interest. And civic space, which we talk about sometimes as closing or as open civic space is really a function from our perspective of our capacity to exercise a few core civic freedoms, uh, freedom of opinion and expression, um, the ability to share and receive information, uh, freedom of association, the ability to form an organization with others um, over a sustained period of time to try to pursue a specific end together, and freedom of peaceful assembly, the ability to come together either online or offline um, to express oneself or to engage in other purposes. So these are the core civic freedoms, freedom of expression, freedom of peaceful assembly, and freedom of association. And ICNL does track measures that uh, are proposed or enacted that affect civic space, that affect civic freedoms. And the story in recent years has not been positive. You know, my organization started working um, in, in the 90s, and that was a much more optimistic time for work on civic freedoms and civic space. That was an environment in which governments, which were liberalizing governments, particularly in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet bloc, were looking to set up legal frameworks that actually enabled civil society and allowed civil society to operate. That is not what we're seeing now. Um, so for instance, um, in the data we're tracking from 2016 to 2021, we, we've tracked um, nearly 300 initiatives that would have impacts on civic space. And of those three quarters of those proposed or enacted initiatives would, would have had a restrictive effect on civic freedoms, whereas only a quarter would have had an enabling effect. Um, and it, the trend is not uh, positive either from 2020 to, 2021, the measures that we tracked with impacts on the civic space, 90% of those were restrictive and only 10% of those were enabling. Um, so by and large, we are seeing a, a raft of measures that um, make it more difficult to exercise civic freedoms, that make it more difficult for civil society to operate. And, um, you know, we can, I think, talk a little more later as to why we're seeing these effects. An important aspect of this certainly is learning between um, governments that are imposing these types of restrictive measures. Um, uh, and I, I think there's other uh, uh, features there, such as the rise of populist governments, even in uh, nominally democratic countries. But I just want to sort of give a flavor of the type of civic space restrictions that we're seeing, just to discuss a few um, that, that are particularly common with respect to each of these civic freedoms. So with respect to freedom of association, again, that's our ability to come together as an organization for a defined period. What we're seeing are, for instance, as, as George mentioned, um, uh, restrictions on access to foreign funding, including foreign agent registration laws. Um, perhaps the most well-known of these is the, is the foreign agents law in Russia, which requires uh, media organizations, nonprofit organizations, individuals that are engaged in political activity and receive any funding from abroad, even from friends or family to be designated as foreign agents. And for example, in their publications or in their public statements to, to lead those by stating that they've been designated as public as foreign agents. 
And in terms of authoritarian learning, we're seeing, and I'll note, by the way, that um, uh, Russia has pointed to the US's own Foreign Agent Registration Act as an example of why it is legitimate to have these types of measures that specifically designate those receiving foreign funding and engaging in political advocacy. But it is, as an example of authoritarian learning, what we're seeing is um, that foreign agents laws are being proposed or enacted in other places. Uh, so Nicaragua has enacted a foreign agents registration law. Um, uh, uh, late last year in El Salvador, a foreign agent registration law was proposed and then withdrawn, but the government has said that they intend to, to reintroduce it. And in Mexico, um, in the Senate, uh, a foreign agent law has also been proposed. And sort of a particularly concerning feature of these types of laws is that they, um, in, in, in these proposed laws, also impose restrictions on the type of advocacy that um, designated foreign agents can engage in. So that's the type of uh, restriction on association that we're seeing. Um, other restrictions include uh, prohibitions or criminalization of participating or organizing um, an unregistered organization um, and the dissolution and suspension of civil society organizations often for um, uh, uh, often on, on very mild or slight violations of the law. For instance, in Nicaragua under the Ortega regime in recent years, more than 150 civil society organizations have been suspended or dissolved, as well as six independent universities. Um, so turning to freedom of peaceful assembly. Um, uh, so, so 2019 was widely considered, widely viewed as the year of peaceful protest, that around the world there was mobilization, people were taking to the streets. But we have also seen a crackdown on peaceful, on peaceful protests and protests around the world. Um, mass arrests, use of violence to police um, protests, use of the military to police protests. And um, we're not just seeing that in countries which have traditionally been considered to be non-democratic, but as the George Floyd protests last year provide an example of the United States of the violent policing, the policing by the military of protests. Um, we've seen other examples of such crackdowns on protests, um, really in, in every inhabited continent. In, in the Belarus around contested elections last year, um, in Thailand with respect to the anti-monarchical protests at the end of 2020, um, and right now in Russia, um, we've seen widespread arrests going on uh, with respect to protests against the Ukraine war. So this mass mobilization is, is uh, in terms of protests is being countered by but by a crackdown on peaceful protest. Um, and you know, we can surmise that a reason for that is that mass mobilization is often something that precedes uh, regime change. It precedes uh, widespread calls for a change in government or an improvement in governance. Um, and you know, to note a few other trends with respect to peaceful assembly, we're seeing heightened restrictions on peaceful protests. For instance, um, in the United States, we've seen a raft of proposed measures at the state and federal level that would impose, um, that would criminalize or impose heavy penalties for conducting protests around critical infrastructure, which seems pretty plainly designed to discourage protests around pipelines, around gas pipelines, um, to discourage climate protest. And then just quickly to speak about freedom of expression, um, we're seeing a, a number of measures that criminalize, especially online expression. This is, can be through fake news laws, through cybercrime laws, um, that uh, are often extremely vaguely drafted and therefore authorize the state to detain those or to penalize those who engage in expression online that is the, the government disfavors. Um, as an example of this, in, in Bangladesh, the Digital Security Act has been used to arrest journalists who are merely reporting on, on, on factual uh, uh, occurrences by the government because the language of the DSA is sufficiently vague to cover that type of activity. Um, and under COVID, this has only become more widespread. We've seen measures adopted around the world that penalize engaging in expression that counters official narratives about uh, COVID measures or COVID um, cases. So these are some of the types of restrictions that we're seeing around the world. And the reason why I wanted to discuss these is because I think that there, it's really important to consider how these general restrictions on civil society in a larger sense, how they specifically affect the environment for human rights defenders. So in many jurisdictions, we have seen um, in the last decade, the adoption of human rights defenders policies of uh, complaints mechanisms, of protection mechanisms, but really um, 
one of the best mechanisms to ensure that there is space for human rights defenders to operate and to, to uh, protect the safety of human rights defenders is an empowered civil society and open civic space. And this is for a variety of reasons, but when individuals can exercise their civic freedoms in a free environment, it provides an incredibly important collective defense mechanism for members of civil society and in particular for human rights defenders. Um, this, is, this is through a variety of pathways um, that having open civic space allows for more um, robust and accurate reporting on abuses and threats to human rights defenders. Um, it allows uh, civil society to more effectively demand accountability for threats and attacks on those on activists. It allows mobilization of additional activists as civil society is better resourced, better mobilized, and there is strength in numbers um, that, that makes it more difficult to target those who are engaging in advocacy. Um, we also see more widespread public protests and rallies to express solidarity and support for human rights defense. Um, public campaigns to push back against stigmatization are more effective. And then it's, it's um, also uh, more possible to organize um, uh, mechanisms for defense against criminalization, defense against lawsuits that are targeting human rights defenders by, for instance, trying to create networks of pro bono lawyers. Um, and in, in addition, a more um, robust civil society, a better resource civil society generally has better connections with the government, can more effectively intercede to try to um, seek accountability for abuses or to forestall abuses. So there's an intimate relationship between the broader environment for civil society, between whether there's a more generally um, closed civic space or a more generally open civic space, and the extent of protection available to those who are engaged in the incredible work of human rights defense, which I think points to the importance of us um, uh, using the mechanisms that we can, using uh, international mechanisms, using bilateral diplomacy, using support for our partners in countries around the world, using, using um, uh, efforts to raise public awareness in order to ensure that the environment for civil society and the environment for civic freedoms is enabling, so as to ensure that that collective defense mechanism for activists and for human rights defenders can operate effectively. Thanks so much. Thank you, Nikhil. Uh, now, Tine. Hello, Tine. Uh, is, uh, the floor is yours. She's going to address us on reclaiming rights. Thank you, George. Thanks, Brian and Nikhil. Um, I'd like to provide this case study you know, of, uh, on the Philippines uh, to speak to the whys in this discussion. And, um, well, to be uh, frank, uh, there, there have been uh, questions likewise, no? uh, on, especially right now, where when uh, we are in the brink of an election that will um, um, hopefully not, but most probably so, bring back uh, the uh, uh, sons uh, or the, 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 the son and daughter of uh, a dictator uh, 20, 30 years ago, and uh, the current um, government, the current administration right now. Well, these are the second generation of a Marcos senior and uh, Duterte presidency in the Philippines. And we've been, we've been being asked, um, how did this happen? I mean, you'd, you've had um, people power revolutions uh, and yet, how can, how the hell can this happen in, in the place, uh, in, in the Philippines, when you've had a very strong uh, civil society, even during martial law and up to the present? You know? Some may be grappling at these questions, you know? but as um, Brian said, uh, the many years uh, of the social movements here in the Philippines enabled us, um, perhaps the current generation of activists right now, to have a more uh, studied and frank discussion uh, within our history of social movements to easily offer uh, views, um, especially considering our whole history you know, in, in contending with such forms of authoritarian uh, regimes uh, in the Philippines. You know, one easy answer <laughs> that I can offer is that 
um, how um, tyrants like Duterte would emerge or how uh, the son of the former dictator, um, Ferdinand Marcos, you know, would lead, uh, run away, take the lead in these elections and probably get elected as president, you know, would be uh, the issue of dissonance between words and actions or the policy inconsistency of the regimes that came after that. The regime that came after um, the martial law uh, government uh, in 1986 spoke of human rights, spoke of development, spoke of you know, civil society. Uh, it's there in the constitution. Uh, President Corazon Aquino went to the US, spoke about it uh, before the US Congress. But things are different on the ground. Um, and this has continued, this type of um, governance has continued uh, way uh, into the past um, 20 years when her son assumed the presidency. And so um, this kind of, this, this politics developed by, neo, uh, by, by liberal, so-called liberal uh, political parties um, in some way, contributed to the rise of um, uh, people or political parties uh, like that of Duterte, uh, which, um, which can be considered a very, uh, a party that, you know, swings more and more to the right, you know, by the day. We see this in how uh, the, the, the current administration, the Duterte administration, has handled or spoken about the drug war and uh, the counterinsurgency campaigns you know, in the Philippines. I mean, it, when, when President Duterte said in his campaign that uh, drug addicts are not humans, uh, we know that we are back to uh, that situation where um, human rights or, or uh, the issues of human lives you know, would... Um, would uh, be um, something that will be played up to, um, to show that a strong man rule is further needed you know, in the country to offer peace and order you know, or to offer um, some respite from uh, the vast or the, the worsening uh, rates of criminality. You know? But of course, these are all, these are all just hype you know, to... For, for people like Duterte to come into power. At the same time, um, there have been uh, several statements on uh, the human rights. Uh, we, we have been called an organization of demons. No? I mean, you can call us many things, <laughs> but we're quite surprised that we were painted like you know, some sort of a religious organizations, uh, organizations uh, with which we are not at all. No? But when you call us an organization of demons, uh, you are painted in a position, uh, especially in a predominantly Catholic country like ours. No? Uh, you are painted in a position that, uh, wait, um, what is this guy trying to do? No? Uh, when there are, uh, when you hear that uh, your the president uh, says kill, kill, kill every day to any uh, problem uh, that arises, and he continues to do that. No, when there's a problem on uh, the uh, mobility of people during the time of the pandemic. There's this problem on drugs. There's this problem on uh, the internal conflict or uh, there's this problem on, I don't know, press freedom. Uh, he always says, kill someone, shoot this, uh, shoot them dead. You know? And that has quite an effect you know, on, on uh, the public psyche as well as on the civil society. Um, in, in the drug war, I think um, aside from you know, counting uh, the number of people killed to look at how uh, these words of uh, the president has impacted um, much on, on, on the ground, you know, I, I, I would like to think that the most uh, impact that it had was on the level of social solidarity in communities and uh, you know, among families even of victims of uh, the drug war. Because what it has done is that um, 
that's isolated the communities more, one family to another family, because you can't show even uh, some sort of uh, empathy when 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 your um, when when a member of your household gets killed in the course of the drug war in the Philippines, no, you you uh, hold wakes alone no? because your neighbors will be afraid of um, being associated with you. No? And before that, it's not that kind of you know um, level uh, in in the communities in the Philippines, no, but. Uh, the drug war has had that impact you know, that has had that I think a lasting impact you know, on um, on the level of social solidarity that we have you know. um, at the same time uh, the counterinsurgency campaign has upended many lives it has certainly upended mine you know, with uh, the many uh, forms of violations which includes uh, killings the use of what we call uh, lawfare, the use of the law to criminalize uh, human rights defenders, resulting to many arrested and detained, and the rising number of political prisoners. Um, nearly a million, we were also surprised with the documentation that we had, you know, that nearly a million, half a million um, uh, individuals in the Philippines have been threatened and red tagged. You know, there's what we call red tagging right now. Um, it's like the red baiting uh, concept throwback to the McCarthyist era uh, many years ago. Uh, but it's, this essentially means that uh, you get uh, tagged as a supporter, member, whatever, you know, of the Communist Party of the Philippines and it places you in a difficult position. You, know? you get you know, staged for um, worse violations. Um, and then, uh, well, it's not so surprising because even the vice president has been red tagged. You know? um, many are being tagged as terrorists with the anti-terror law in place. Uh, members of, you know, even bookstores have been uh, tagged as terrorists or red uh, or red supporters. And this is this has been so easy with uh, social media right now and when you have social media or tech companies that do, you know do not respond <laughs> you've tried many times with facebook they have not responded uh, much to uh, the complaints on online threats and so um uh we'd like to offer some of the key lessons that we've learned you know, in the process um in in the course of all this um uh, on, on the current situation that we have right now in the country. I think what um, Brian said on, uh, and Nick Hill said on uh, the strong, a strong civil society and social movements, I, I think it's, it's the backbone. It has been the backbone you know, of where we are right now. I mean, we could not have survived <laughs> at the Duterte administration, six years of this kind of administration without the strength of uh, the organized uh, movements that we have. You know? Of course, we know that we need to do better, which means that we have to organize more, we have to learn new tactics. You know? But at the end of the day, um, even if there's an intense pressure on civil society here to you know, not exist, you know? we exist. You know? And um, uh, we continue to work together. The second thing is that, um, what the situation has done is not only make us stronger, but it also helped us build more connections among each other. I mean, before we, we didn't um, have such strong uh, conversations or spaces with members of the media, people, the, the journalists. I mean, it's like, this is civil society, there's a line. You know? This is civil society, this is media, and then, you know, we do our own thing. You know? But right now, uh, given uh, the, this, the common um, attacks that we receive and the levels of um, impunity in the country, um, we have had stronger uh, platforms uh, and networks that we've built together, both civil society and media. 
we have this um, platform called Facts First uh, Philippines. It's like a network of fact checkers, civil society, um, business, and legal associations working on the elections right now. Um, and lastly, um, we think that rights claiming, um, I mean, you know, taking back the narratives on human rights includes not only the gloom and doom type of stuff, stuff you know, that we say most often. You know, it also includes, it should also include our narratives of, yes, we should, you know, outline how we live uh, we should document how we live uh, each day under these kinds of administrations, but we should also document our wins you know? and um, not really to, you know, to, to bolster our own morale, you know? but we need to look at our uh, narratives of hope. Because if we don't do that, you know, uh, we will not earn the confidence to continue our work. You know? Anyone would be wins, you no? Know? And we do have wins. Uh, we push back. Uh, we, we, uh, to a certain extent, the Human Rights Defenders Bill, you no, know, a protection, um, uh, a bill of protecting human rights defenders has passed Congress. It has not been signed by the president, but it is there. So uh, that's that's one area you know, that we can, you know, um, better ourselves. But I don't think that um, we are, I, Brian was correct, no? I don't think that we are in a situation uh, that we are in a quandary and, you know, we don't know how to do or to make um, things better. <laughs> um, two minutes. We are in a better situation, if I may um, offer that view, precisely because of the um, lessons that we had uh, the past few decades on uh, how uh, civil society has been strengthened, how social movements have been formed in the Philippines. And um, right now, the international community, in fact, has been more active, if I may um, look at it, no? because of not only among civil society, but also with governments who work with civil society to um, address these problems in the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you, Tini. And uh, our last speaker, Philippe Levillon, he's going to address the issue of, of environmental land defenders and the forms of violence that they face as they are trying to do their work. Philippe. Philippe, you are muted. Uh, Philippe, you continue to be muted. Okay, sorry ah. for that. I'm trying to share slide and of course it's always a bit of a mess but anyway you see them and i hope you uh, see me as well so i'll be briefly talking about the case of environmental and land defenders uh why well uh in part because they constitute uh, you know the majority of of, of um uh, human rights defenders uh that, that are uh, you know the most uh, nicely uh, tar targeted so um what are and who are environmental and land defenders? They're individuals or groups of people who take peaceful action to protect the environment and or land rights. Uh, I'll join uh, Brian Dooley's uh, initial remark on, on saying, you know, the situation has improved when you look at, you know, 40, 50 years ago, but, you know, it has degraded if you look back at the 20, 30 years. And I'll try to explain a little bit uh, why. So, uh, when you are looking at the statistics that uh, Brian pointed out, and many of you are, uh, of course, familiar with them and Global Witness, uh, you know, an NGO, I, I, and I disclose here that I worked for them on several of the initial campaigns. Um, the idea was really to do a little bit with, like with, uh, you know, reporters without borders. Uh, it was also triggered by the fact that their main collaborator in Cambodia was killed, and that really uh, shocked them. Uh, we had 
uh, previous uh, members who had been arrested and beaten up, but this was certainly a step that was, uh, you know, unprecedented. And so they started documenting that uh, in 2012. Uh, and of course, reporting quality has improved. Uh, you know, more people are reporting these things. There are more civil societies on the ground, etc. Nonetheless, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, a rise in particular from, uh, you know, the, the mid 2000s um, that has been very uh, preoccupying. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, about 50-60% of the HRDs that have been documented by Frontline uh, where people work on uh, defending land, environmental, indigenous, and people's rights. So what we would categorize as, uh, you know, frontline defenders. I've got a categories here. You don't need to read that through too much, but essentially I distinguish a little bit between defenders and defenders of defenders. So the, the defenders are in the first category, indigenous people and rural community members, farm workers, landless peasants, etc. And very often you find the secondary layer that consists of environmental activists, social movement activists, artists, public intellectuals, lawyers, journalists, judges. And there is another category that has sometimes uh, been included into that. And personally, I don't, because very often those are agents of the states who themselves, in order to protect wildlife, fisheries, whatever, uh, they are, uh, you know, uh, infringing uh, human rights, uh, displacement uh, through uh, uh, protected areas, etc. So again, I'll go quite quickly because we've covered a lot of this uh, already, but so who are these people? Well, a large number of them are people who self-identify as not only protecting the environment and, and the land, but also some uh, forms of livelihood, some forms of communities, etc. And many of them have been, you know, willing to uh, put their life on the front line in, in contexts where we know that those um, those, those struggles are, are deadly, are very dangerous to take on. And so this, uh, as a Claudio and his wife, Maria, um, and, you know, they uh, decided like many uh, landless peasants to uh, set up a little place uh, in order to uh, tap local forest resources while protecting the forest. It's the reserve system that is well established in, in Brazil. And confronted by logging groups, they nonetheless, you know, held their ground. Uh, to the point of being killed in 2011. Uh, there are uh, other people, and of course, many of you will have seen in your generation, uh, certainly, uh, you know, uh, Berta Caceres, uh, who has also been like, I would say, the iconic figure uh, of uh, these people for, uh, for the past uh, decade or so. Um, Berta, in particular, had been awarded the Goldman Environmental Prize in 2015, and that showed that rather than protecting her, it raised further its profile, and she was uh, killed essentially by uh, the dam company that was trying to push uh, uh, an hydropower project uh, in Honduras. And so uh, Berta was among those people who uh, helped to uh, mobilize. So she's both a kind of a frontline defenders, but it was not her own community that was uh, protected by uh, the dam, but she helped mobilize uh, these people. So the threats against defenders are well known and well documented. It's difficult to have an idea of proportions. Um, some of my colleagues here uh, at the York School, uh, the Osgood Law School, uh, were trying to do that by looking at the number of different categories. So what they came up for 28 mining companies listed on the stock exchange and operating in 13 countries in Latin America between 2000 and 2015. The proportion of uh, killing or disappearances to injury or to arrest and criminalization was the one you see on your screen. So about one to 10 for injury and one to 20 for arrest and criminalization it gives you a little bit of a sense of the scale. And again, this is for an industry that comes from uh, under a lot of scrutiny. We can imagine that this is much wider and you know, pervasive abuse is much more widespread in sectors where uh, intimidation is very much part of the game play, for example, in land struggles. So I've looked at the different questions that were put to this uh, panel, and I, I apologize for that. It's going to be a little bit of a rote learning and rote uh, going through these things. But so what are the main factors that have contributed to the shrinking of civil spaces? And a little bit like Brian, I'd like to point out a number of paradoxes that are important for us to, to grasp probably and discuss. Uh, the first one is that democratization has had some backlash. We have to admit that. Uh, one of my, my first time to realize that, I worked in Cambodia for many years in the early 90s, and one of my best friends there was documenting illegal arrests, etc., essentially shadow prisons that were not on the map, and the police were incarcerating and torturing people uh, in, in, if you want, like dark prison, dark prison system. 
and, 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 and it kind of died down, but the executions increased. And in his conclusion was that, well, you know, as long as it was an authoritarian regime, they could jail them, uh, but now they kill them. And so we've seen a kind of escalation resulting from that environment. So of course, it's not to argue we need to go back to authoritarianism, uh, but we see this kind of, uh, of backlash resulting. Of course, uh, also with democratization can uh, contentious forms of politics uh, that uh, you know, have heightened the stake. Uh, the second one, and that may be also a bit of a surprise to some, is that improved openness and improved quality of governance have motivated resistance because people have the hope that uh, protest and other types of strategies will be effective, that there is more room for uh, engagement and possible reforms by government. So some of my colleagues, for example, have looked at uh, uh, at uh, the quality of governance in, in Latin American countries, and they realize that, well, strangely enough, the higher the governance is, the more protest uh, you end up with. It doesn't mean that the repression will be always harder, but this is important to look at. The third one is that we've seen this kind of progressive politics. Not only did we see democratization, but we saw what came to be, uh, you know, uh, termed in uh, Latin America, the so-called pink tide, uh, Bolivarian socialist uh, parties coming uh, with very progressive agendas. And what I've heard in Brazil from activists, for example, is that the incorporation of social leaders, grassroots leaders, into those bureaucracies have left a little bit uh, the movements, um, to some extent, orphaned. And also the integration of these leaders into bureaucracy has meant that they've been much more um, you know, uh, influenced by other types of agenda that the progressive agenda that they have. So uh, there's been a little bit also of a counter uh, uh, productive effect at that level. And the first, first one, of course, which is the geopolitical one, is that there's kind of a populist nationalism uh, that is tapping into public resentment as the, at the inequities resulting from globalization and fears of decline. So we've seen it with the rise of China, which is very complex to uh, grasp and, uh, in terms of its many implications, uh, white fragility, uh, etc. Okay, so the second question was why are human rights defenders, particularly environmental uh, activists, become a target of uh, armed states and non-state armed groups? Well, looking here at environmental and land defenders, uh, the main factor I would say has been the primary commodity boom since the early 2000s. So uh, essentially the intensity of the world economy was going down and with the arrival of China, essentially it has gone up. Um, the second thing is that of course activists stand in the way of profits, modernist ideas of progress, and very often settler state authority as they try to assert their own sovereign territorialities on the ground. Uh, the third one is that the environmental justice organizations have sharply increased in number, reach, capacity, and they've been able to promote resistance to harmful projects. And one of the main determinants of the spread of conflicts uh, in Latin America, for example, in the Andean region, has been this connection with well-organized environmental justice organization, the uh, mutual learning. So it's not only authoritarian learning that we've seen, as Nikki uh, very nicely put, uh, but also uh, advocacy learning, etc. Uh, the third one, which I explored uh, in a paper on uh, populist eco, um, on so-called so eco-populism, is that defenders can be seen or portrayed instrumental in an instrumental way as political allies of progressive, but and then of uh, progressive political parties that will endanger a conservative notion of what the nation is, what patriarchy can secure, etc. And the fourth one, which is statistically well demo demonstrated, is that environmental and land defenders are often located in rural locations where there is greater judicial and political impunity. So what I mean by that is that not only the police uh, or local militias can act with impunity, but also because they are in remote locations, the death or the crushing of a local protest at a village is less likely to trigger an urban large scale a protest that would then be leveraged by an opposition political party. Okay. So continuing here and illustrating that a little bit. So the community boom, as I mentioned, uh, you know, of course we all remember the land grab, etc. Uh, I don't want to go into the uh, constitution of what has been called the anocracies, but those weak regimes. Uh, which were in the minority until the 90s and became the second largest number of, uh, you know, and, and it's well demonstrated also in terms of homicide, political killings, etc. the so-called hypothesis of uh, murder uh, in the middle. Again, to illustrate a little bit the points that I've made, 
Uh, on the right, you've got essentially the number of mining conflicts uh, in Latin America, and you see the beginning of it in the 1990s. Of course, there's liberalization, there's fewer protests generally against state-owned uh, mining companies, and they're essentially related to labor rather than environmental and social aspects. And from the 2000 onward, uh, an exponential uh, rise in, in number. So that has left us, if you want, with a situation in which the number of environmental justice conflict has really increased tremendously and gained a lot of legitimacy as people um, very much understand the need to change our habits, but find it very difficult because it threatens their livelihood, their well-being, their leisure time, whatever. But essentially, we, you know, the environmental justice atlas has, has well documented that. So turning a little bit to what factors, uh, what sectors are uh, most involved, here, but about two thirds of the conflicts relate to extraction, whether it's water, biomass, energy, or minerals. Um, and the most deadly are mining and biomass and land use, okay? About twice as uh, the rest of the sectors. Here, it's an unreadable slide that I put together, but essentially it's to uh, highlight the fact that Latin America has uh, the highest level of repression, criminalization, violent targeting, and death. Uh, but it's not where uh, um, protest uh, and movements uh, fail the most. Where it fails the most is actually Sub-Saharan Africa. And it helps maybe to explain a little bit why there are fewer protests uh, in, in Africa, but it's something we need to go into. So when we look at the killings and what happens when where, essentially it's highly concentrated. 77% of the killings are within seven countries, all of which are in Latin America. Uh, it, however, is related in part to the size of the countries, but also to uh, levels of impunity, etc. About a third are indigenous people, 10% as are women, and 65% are what I would call social leaders in their prime. Interestingly, what we expected to find is a lot of young people being killed because they are more radical, they are put at the forefront, and, but that's not quite the case because very often these are targeted killings and they're killing people who are typically in their 40s, 50s uh, and have uh, Afghan and are still very active uh, in, in, this, uh, in these endeavors. In terms of the perpetrators, about half of them are clearly related to uh, uh, the government. And then, of course, many of the hitmen and criminal organizations have also close ties with government and with uh, crony businesses, etc. Now, the third, the fourth question, I've lost track, it was, are there any variations between democratic and authoritarian regimes in the measures adopted against civil society actors? And uh, the statistics here are, are very clear. And again, we come back to this idea of anocracies. It's also countries that are generally middle income with high levels of resource rents, where contentious politics, the politics of public protest, if you want, are quite widespread. There is a political culture. And so civil society, you know, is very active and that's why We've got these this results in part and, and necessary results, uh, you know, mentioning that uh, civil society, when they're able to not only mobilize protests, but also legal pursuits, uh, petitions, uh, building solidarity, they become much more uh, successful. Okay, so multi-track action by uh, human rights defenders are, are very positive. Okay, I will not have time to go too much into Honduras, but it's just to illustrate a little bit what a political change triggers. So essentially, if you follow my little arrow until 2009, you're under a progressive leftist government. Most of the killing that you can observe are linked to small logging gang operating in remote areas, killing people who resist essentially, uh, plus uh, possibly some involvement in narco trafficking. And after the arrival of a right-wing uh, president, uh, we find ourselves into a situation where there is a rapid escalation with two main phases. The initial phase is a, a feeling of impunity by the latifundios, the people who control the land, who feel that now they can chase the poor people who had been kind of reclaiming those lands. And the second phase is after the initial period of contracting, etc. Uh, you've got boots on the ground for ma major corporations, including Chinese corporation and, and Canadian corporations for mining, hydro, etc. And, and you see a bigger diversity of the type of sectors, mining and dams in particular, and agribusinesses uh, that become uh, involved in this. And uh, essentially, uh, you will see two types of movements, the more landless ones. Uh, very often, these are not receiving as much attention from the media beyond the country or at least the region. 
Uh, and another ones where you've got more indigenous people, charismatic people like uh, Berta Caceres. And there you will see a much more, uh, you know, reaction to that in particular, you know, global, um, you know, frontline newspapers in the in case of Berta for sure, uh, and some reaction. So in the case of Berta Caceres, there was actually a trial, they figured out the intelligence was mobilized uh, and they tracked down the people who committed it. Plus it led to basically a freezing of investment into the hydropower sector of Honduras uh, for several years. Okay, so uh, while the international community has promoted a series of initiatives to combat these measures, they've been uh, very ineffective. Why? So I'll list a few here that I've gra grabbed, grasped a little bit. The first one is international organizations have very little capacity. I remember being in Geneva, talking with the HR Special Rapporteur on Defenders. If that's a title, there's somebody. How many staff does he have? Or she has at the time? Two. <laughs> two people for the entire planet. Okay, so it's a team of three, a senior one and two staff. Okay. The second one is the diplomatic missions clearly prioritize business projects. We've written a paper on this on the case of Canadian embassies. We've had people anecdotally who tell us, I've talked to Canadians, and they say, yeah, 90% of my job is pushing mining projects, okay? Uh, the third one is that the governments are very much flipping these international norms and support as being anti-patriotic, foreign-funded agents, decadent values, etc. The first time I heard foreign-funded radicals was not in the Philippines or in Brazil. It was in Canada from the mouth of the Minister of Natural Resources himself. Okay. So this is really saying that it's not a problem with just democracy. It's a problem with a particular vision of who those people represent. And the fourth one is that there are multiple layers of government. There is often a capture of local security. Uh, you know, most of the police in narco trafficking areas are paid by the narco. Uh, political competition also is instrumentalizing uh, conflicts. What we often see is aspiring mayors also will contribute to an escalation of the conflict in the hope of winning the next municipal election. So it's a complex situation. And the last one, and I don't want to excuse the companies, but sometimes we can see also that the companies are not fully in control of uh, the security personnel uh, that they uh, have mobilized. And that despite clear voluntary principle that dictate, uh, you know, the way it should be done. So just to conclude, I don't want to go too much over time. To what extent strategies and tactics adopted by civil society organizations and human rights defenders may have contributed to the current predicament? I would say the first one is there are many diverse strategies of, of resistance, and sometimes they include broader uh, political opposition agenda. And from that moment, uh, you enter a realm where, depending on the scale at which these uh, movements are taking place, well, they become a political target, and at that, a very soft political target, okay? And, and that's a major uh, problem. The second one that we can see is uh, those tactics of repression escalate when we see uh, challenges to state authority and sovereignty. As long as you're writing petition and go through the court system, it may be okay. But if you start to challenge politically the court system, the police, etc., the authority, we see more brutal policing and judicial sentencing. And here, I illustrate that. Again, I'm not going to go anywhere else than uh, 20 kilometers up the road from uh, my own house here in Vancouver. And we can clearly see this. It's a paper wrote for, uh, with, with Mike Simpson. Uh, uh, essentially, we see two models here on the left. Uh, you've got Elizabeth May, an MT leader of the Green Party, now the Speaker of the House uh, in Canada. And you can see a smiling, uh, you know, uh, po policeman. She wants to embrace law and she wants to make a point through the law and through a settler <laughs> law. <laughs> and so she's consolidating, in a way, uh, the colonial order of Canada. And on the right, what you have is uh, Dan Wallace, and, and I know it's a difficult picture to look at, but uh, uh, Chief Dan Wallace gave his permission to use this picture. Dan Wallace was actually trying to establish a dialogue between some of the most so-called radical protesters and the police. And while he was doing that, he was actually put to the ground and, 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 and brutalized. Uh, why? Well, in part because of the level of distrust, uh, racism being at play, but also because indigenous order represents a challenge uh, to uh, the settler order uh, in Canada. And of course, in many societies uh, where we are talking about 
uh, this is being uh, played out at, at different degrees, etc. Okay. Uh, and finally, the third one, which also is a difficult conversation to have, but uh, it's about the tactics of escalation and a possible culture of martyrdom in some of those movements, uh, especially when you have crowded fields of struggles. You can imagine a country like Peru, so many mining conflicts, so many other conflicts, etc. And here I'll just put a quote by one of the activists uh, who told me it takes a death to bring a minister. Okay, so a very shocking thing because it means essentially that they are entering a field of escalation that may be uh, leading also an escalation on part of the repression. Again, so of course the idea is very much to avoid these situations and for that, uh, you know, it's important that we try to tackle the root causes, we develop and apply legally binding instruments, we support and protect defenders and we ensure that there is accountability for abuses and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philippe. Before we open the floor to discussion, I want to first, and I have a question to, for all uh, participants, but first I want to ask if anybody from the panel has any comments on additional comments based on what you've heard from the other panelists. Anybody? Briefly, though, please. If you have any comments, briefly. Anybody? Yeah. George, if I could. Yeah. Yeah, if I could just offer a couple of additional thoughts regarding, I think, the, the very interesting hypotheses and explanations offered by Philippe specifically regarding the ineffectiveness of international organizations um, to more effectively push for expanded civic space and for human rights. I do think that there's a few other um, perhaps less structural uh, factors that may also be influencing the, the inability of these organizations, these international organizations for diplomatic engagement to have an impact. One of those, I think, is that since 2001, much of the sort of um, uh, international diplomatic efforts of including leading Western countries have been aimed at prosecuting a counterterrorism agenda. Mm -hmm. And that counterterrorism agenda has often involved um, claims that restricting civic space, restricting human rights, restricting quote unquote extremist organizations will effectively lead to reducing the violence resulting from terrorism. And we continue to see ramifications from that to the present day, both in continued sort of push for um, anti-terrorism measures by Western powers, continued adoption of um, such measures, such as anti-terrorism law in the Philippines recently adopted last year, um, mm -hmm. and also um, continued um, sort of activity by international um, mechanisms, such as the Financial Action Task Force, which, um, uh, uh, sets up standards for anti-money laundering and, and counterterrorism measures. Um, that the, the standards of FATF have, have in many cases been misapplied, misinterpreted to um, warrant more extreme restrictions being placed on civil society, more extreme restrictions being placed on their access to financial services or their access to, to funding. So that's one point just to note. I think another important point to note is that in the last two decades, we've seen that moving from what was a unipolar moment with the US supposedly being the sole world superpower, we now have a variety of sources of funding and support for uh, different regimes around the world, um, including from, especially from China for infrastructure funding um, and for direct investment, um, including especially commodities, as Philippe said. Um, and that has meant that simply there's a, there's a lot more competition. There's, uh, for, for, there's a lot more available sources of patronage. Um, and I think that is also coupled with more recently the recession of the United States, for instance, from the world stage. Now, I don't think the United States is, has ever been really uh, as dependable an ally to the human rights movement as we would want it to be. But I think it, it, it has really been true that in recent years, for instance, U U.S. not being on the Human Rights uh, um, Council, um, the U.S. not really investing um, diplomatic capital um, in, in pushing back against restrictive enactments has made it much more difficult because uh, I, I think as Philippe rightly said, in many cases, these Western powers 
are pushing for economic development for the interests of their domestic um, corporations. But where those aren't necessarily the dominant concerns, that has often been incredibly valuable and helpful to have, for instance, the US diplomatic mission in, in a certain country intervening to push for the release of a particular act activist or intervening to um, push back against the um, enactment of a restrictive law. And as we've seen less of that activity in, in recent years, it's become more difficult to enlist diplomatic allies to, to, to push for expanded civic space and to push for the protection of activists. So okay. there's, those are just some additional thoughts that occurred to me yeah. in um, seeing Philippe's excellent presentation. Um, uh, thank you, Nikhil. Anybody else from the panel? Any thoughts? Okay, um, I would like to, to start the conversation. Um, now I'd like to pick on something that Brian said concerning how things were worse in the 60s and 70s and they are bad now, but not compared to then. And one thing of course that makes very different the current situation is that since the 60s and 70s and several other speakers have alluded to that, we do have a proliferation of international mechanism and processes. We have a proliferation of human rights treaties. We have optional protocols that uh, human rights, for example, activists can use to file petitions uh, 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 for the misbehavior of the state uh, 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 in particular situations. We have uh, reporting procedures. They, every X numbers of years, they are supposed to state submit reports to these mechanisms. So there is a certain monitoring. We have the Human Rights Council, we've had tribunals, we have the Human Rights High Commissioner for Human Rights, we have a proliferation of rapporteurs, including one for human rights defenders. And then it seems that all of these things somehow does, has not added much to protecting the civic space if you look at it in the last 20 or 30 years, despite we've had this proliferation of mechanisms. So what the question I would like to ask you is, what exactly from your experience is the added value of the international mechanism processes in the issue area that we're dealing with today? What exactly have they contributed? I mean, is it worth it, for example, to spend for human rights much energy and resources to try to approach this mechanism to try to generate some kind of an international attention to their, to their cause. How much of this really is helping is domestically? And should they be devoting some of their energies more towards the domestic arena as opposed to trying to use the international platform to promote their agendas? I was wondering what is your thought on that? Uh, yes, was that at me? If it wasn't, um, then I'd like to answer it anyway. Um, I think uh, the answer, the short answer is that those international mechanisms have had uh, mixed results, let's say. Uh, but I think the important thing here is, in all of this discussion really, is to recognise that the the expertise on assessing risk to human rights defenders uh, actually lies with the defenders themselves. And so if they think it's a good idea to try to make a noise um, at uh, a country's UPR or to try and embarrass a country at the Human Rights Council or to try and register a complaint through one of the special rapporteurs, um, then I think we should always say they know best. And if they think that those mechanisms are sometimes useful then for me, that's enough justification for those mechanisms to exist and to be resourced. In terms of the whether or not they should focus on domestic um, or international, I mean, I, 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 I know, I assume that you, you're, not, you're not suggesting that it's only ever an either or, of course, of course, of course it isn't. But again, yeah. that, that's up to them, you know. Um, I would say, you know, I've, I have some knowledge of how, how some of those mechanisms work too. Um, and I know that many of the special rapporteurs, I mean, there's one on human rights defenders, there's one also on, on whether there are several others on uh, some overlapping, like freedom of expression, freedom of association yeah. and assembly, you know, freedom of um, 
some human rights defenders are tortured um, and so all those. Those inboxes are flooded with requests from human rights defenders who think that those mechanisms are worth pursuing. So I would say that's a defense enough, a justification enough for the independent expert mechanisms to exist. Also, I would say that there is a pretty good engagement. I, would, I don't want to talk up how effective the UN is at all, believe me, but I, I am impressed also how much engagement there is from defenders in some countries, in some countries with the UPR process. Uh, and I also think that's one of the other thing, one of the other things which works a bit. Uh, but, but again, I, I don't think it's for us to decide, you know, the list of things which are working and aren't, that's for, defend, for defenders to decide um, what they want to use. And as far as I see it, sort of all of the time, some defenders want to use some of those things. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on that from any other of the panelists? George? Christina, yeah. Your organization has been very active in using this mechanism. So I would, I would yeah. welcome your thought, Tina, on this. Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, Brian was correct. You know, the added value of these mechanisms should be determined by the national movements. You know, because if it's you know, not for them and it will worsen our situations, then we should definitely do away with them, right? I mean, not access them or not use them. But if uh, for, for us, at least in the Philippines, what has been working, so to speak, is how the government, um, the, the national government reacts to um, these uh, mechanisms. Now, I mean, it may be a lot different 10 years ago from now, no? but definitely um, they, they still uh, need to show some sort of, uh, they need to show face <laughs> before the international community, whether this government is, you know, uh, pro-China or, you know, um, receiving funds from the U.S. government and all that. Uh, for, for me, it's a space. Huh? And if we don't take up that space and work with the mechanisms, then you, you're leaving it all to uh, governments and we don't want to do that right um, we, we we want to be there because we should be there <laughs> we've won this space no? and we want to a certain extent uh, hold the line there at the same time we see some levels of um, impact on the ground um, we attribute for example the role of the uh, high commissioner for human rights Michelle Bachelet and the special procedures in, um, to a certain extent, blunting efforts by government or plans by government to continue the raids or arrests or worse for brazen, a more brazen forms or spate of arrests in the Philippines. And it, they have moved to, um, uh, you know, write and lobby with the Supreme Court, however way that they did it. <laughs> but they, I think they, they had a role in it because uh, the Supreme Court here issued amended rules on issuances of warrants in conducting these raids. No? And uh, to a certain extent, um, it has um, lessened, the number of these ra raids lessened. No? Um, of course, it's not the, um, the, the full solution, no? but at the same time, it's still something no? to, that, that we, um, we see having an effect on uh, the situation in the country. It depends on, you know, the valuation of uh, the national movements on where uh, international community can play a role. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, any other comments uh, on this uh, uh, by any of the other panelists? By the way, uh, if you have any questions, as I hope you'll have for our panelists, place them on the uh, chat and we'll address them in the order in which they come in. Okay, any questions from the audience? So Nikhil um, or uh, Philippe, any comments or thought on that? No, I mean, maybe among, you know, uh, this emphasis on, on, on domestic instruments and domestic capacity, I think a very important role is uh, accessible lawyers. So very often pro bono lawyers that can, you know, assist many of these communities. Um, when we focus on 
HRDs in urban setting, those are often highly educated people who are already, you know, involved in sometimes multi-generational <laughs> political action, etc. Uh, when we're dealing with uh, rural communities, um, that's not always the case. Their experience has been one of marginalization, lack of access to education. Maybe the current generation speaks the national language, but not the parents. Uh, and so it's very, very important even in that in uh, you know grave cases of uh, murder that uh, they should not be simply have to rely on the local police uh, we've documented several cases where you know the level of evidence was such that clearly an early investigation by uh, you know private investigators and and um, uh, pro bono uh, lawyers would have really helped make a solid case that would have stood in court but delays in getting these things um, has not been gained so to make my point more general, like support for pro bono, uh, you know, HRDs lawyer are is really crucial. Uh, and but often these are costly endeavors. Uh, you know, you have to cover large distances. I, so yeah, I, I had meetings with them in different countries, and and often you know you visit the offices, you look at the budget, and it's quite clear this thinly stretched. And as we know, all you know legal procedures are costly, lengthy. Uh, it takes a lot of devotion, but also uh, very specific, and, you know, mm -hmm. financial support, etc. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, um, Nikki. Any thoughts before we? Any additional comments from your? End? Just to add, with respect to international mechanisms, I think one um, pattern that we have seen, and I don't think, for instance, that this is really true of the Philippines, but. In, in many countries, partners turn to international mechanisms when there is not really much room to engage domestically, certain, certainly in advocacy. So as an example, I think in Nicaragua, with the increasing closing of civic space and with the increasingly adverse environment for civil society there, we see um, civil society partners in Nicaragua turning to regional and international mechanisms more. Um, so in that case, it's not really that they have a choice between domestic advocacy and international advocacy, but that they're turning to international advocacy because spaces for domestic advocacy have been so effectively closed. I think a second point is that uh, um, though the, the sort of civil society groups that can actually attend UN proceedings in, in Geneva in particular, that is a, a very select group, as Philippe says, is most likely groups that are coming from capitals that are quite well resourced. Mm -hmm. But one benefit of attending UN proceedings that are happening in Geneva is that there's opportunities to engage with diplomats from sympathetic countries. There's opportunities to build solidarity, to engage with funders. So the, the sort of utility of the UN as, as a mechanism that um, various actors can convene around is not limited to just formally providing um, submissions to a, to a um, special procedure or providing a UPR submission. Um, but it, it, it additionally is in sort of the convening power of, of that, of the UN as a hub. And this is why the, the COVID pandemic has been so problematic, because it has further restricted sort of the capacity for civil society to engage in Geneva and to engage with each other and to engage with sympathetic diplomatic missions and so forth. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go now. We open the floor to uh, members of the audience to ask questions and... Uh, the first question is, to what extent can we attribute social media and the proliferation of internet access to creating the perception of human rights being worse now than before, somehow due to the creation proliferation? So who would like to, to take a first shot at that? To what extent actually social media are responsible for creating the perception about where we stand on the protection of human rights. Okay, Philippe, <clears throat> and then Brian. Yeah, so very sh briefly, I think there are two aspects to it. One is it will probably lead to uh, a, a proliferation of awareness, and that's a very good thing. Um, it may also give the false impression that it's so bad that it mobilizes people and it basically leads to some potential escalation. Uh, mm -hmm. That is, I think, uh, on the negative side. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a complete question because you, you want more information, but quality information and information that's going to help to uh, 
you know, address the situation rather than inflame it further. So, yeah, I, it's, it's a very good question in terms of, you know, what happens and what is the responsibility of uh, social media in, in that in that respect? So, um, quite complex. Okay, uh, Brian. Thank you. I think that's a great question and a hard one too. Um, I, you know, again, as somebody who remembers the world before the internet, right, and before social media, um, not everything is is that new about what's happening. I mean, the idea that you know, uh, human rights activists, are, it's absolutely human rights activists are being, are being threatened on social media, um, but they were threatened and vilified and put under surveillance and smeared and slurred and gender-based threats and all those things all happened well before the internet was ever invented. And the internet has given certainly a new opportunity for people to express those things. Um, but the internet did not create, you know, misogyny or, or patriarchy or much of the other violent um, um, motivations that people have to want to to tr try and intimidate and and attack human rights defenders um, in a sense it's made it easier although frankly it was never that difficult to write a postcard threatening somebody's life and that used to happen and still happens in some places so i i, I i'm happy i think to to buy uh, at least in part the suggestion that it gives an overall impression that things are terrible, um, which may or may not be true. Uh, but I don't see much new, apart from perhaps the volume of it, I don't see much new happening uh, in terms of threats through social media, except that the way that they're, they're transmitted. Uh, Tina and I actually have, had, uh, have done a fair amount of work on this sort of together. So I'm interested to hear what, what, what she says. Um, but it's one of those things which, you know, looks new, but I think when on closer examination, really, it, it's just old stuff that looks new. Mm. You well, it certainly added one stakeholder in the picture. <laughs> and this is the, uh, another, you know, set of bubble, uh, called the tech, big tech companies, yeah. you know, yeah. um, um, but in, in a way, of course, uh, the messages are carried in a broader expanse. But I guess it depends on, on the context also, because um, while in um, more, what they call more developed countries, uh, there may be infrastructure for such kind of, you know, broader spread of these messages uh, in, in places uh, where there's less access to you know, internet signal, etc. It's it's not the same. Yeah. You know? um, at the same time, uh, it offers. I think it offers more opportunities. Yeah. You know? uh, opportunities for you know advocacy. It's 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 a space that we um, use uh, to amplify our own messages. I guess it it just depends on us. Eh? How do we um, how do we use it? You know, for for the benefit of movements, you know, whatever they do with that space, whatever the right you know side of uh, the political spectrum does with it, how do we address it and how do we use it? Nikhil, mm -hmm. uh, you want to add anything? Yeah, I would just briefly say that I think if the question is whether sort of the the perception of the decline in human rights is because of the availability of accounts of human rights violations. It is sort of an availability bias. I think that there may be some of that, but I do think that we can look to sort of more objective measures or indices of human rights that have been kept for years to see how they have changed over time. And for instance, like Freedom House's Freedom in the World um, report, which uses, I think, a consistent mechanism based on country experts answering like a series of questions about civil and political rights within a country. You know, the Freedom in the World Index is showing a decline in human rights, I think, for the 15th or 16th consecutive year now. So I, I think there is, to some extent, that we're just, social media does make it easier to see negative news about human rights. But I think even if we look at more objective measures, it, there is a genuine phenomenon in which there is closing space and in which there is 
there is less civil, there's less protection for civil and political rights around the world. Okay. Um, other questions from the audience? Anybody? Okay. Uh, Okay, here we have one. Uh, any thoughts to share about it? Um, any thoughts to share about organizations and, uh, for example, which want to play a role in working at policy level to slow the restrictions on civic space? I'm thinking about foundation uh, support organization in Mexico to mention just one example. Mention was made of labeling organizations as foreign agents to make their work difficult, but are there ways to, for panelists to think that they can help secure human rights in their communities? <clears throat> okay, so basically how can organizations on the ground help in order to uh, uh, contain the restriction receiving space, given that a lot of them are operating in environments in which you have these laws uh, that uh, label them or forced to register as foreign agents and therefore trying to stigmatize them. So what are your thoughts on this? Mm -hmm. well, yes, Philip. I, I will start just with this idea of, you know, uh, community level or what we call collective security. I think it is key. We've seen many countries taking initiatives, like in Colombia, they've got a, a very sophisticated, you know, system of bodyguards, etc. Very costly, uh, but also quite ineffective in some ways. So collective security and membership organization is very important on the ground. And that's for, I would say, material security, you know, and knowing who enters, you know, a village area, for example, etc. Now, at the level of politics, obviously, uh, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. That's what I was trying to exp explain a little bit. So uh, when these membership organizations uh, are perceived as more like political parties, then the stakes are uh, increased in a way. And especially if they're foreign funded, and we've seen that in Russia, for example, with many you know, Western funded NGOs, well, then it becomes very easy. So I would say a protective measure for some, uh, you know, uh, organizations may be actually to not what is be under the radar uh, of those ties and have a membership that is really issue or locale based and reserve the space of political action to political parties. And so, of course, this can be very challenging in situations where the political parties are dominated by elites uh, who share powers. I mean, Colombia, again, is a very good example of that. Um, so I, I don't have an easy solution, uh, but I think, you know, uh, your organizations are very much aware of those compromises and trade-offs uh, between support, visibility, uh, how the alliances are perceived, etc. So that, that is quite important. Now at the level of the, at an international level, like major organization with a very broad membership, I'm not an expert to uh, speak on it, but it seems that yes, uh, you know, when you've got organization like Amnesty International, et cetera, that mobilize on certain causes, they can speak for, you know, lots of people. And, and that may help sway an embassy, for example, to be more active uh, than otherwise. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Any of the other panelists want to weigh in on this? Uh, Brian. Yeah, briefly, I, I would say I, I'm not really disagreeing with Philippe, but, but I, I guess I'm using the word political in a slightly different way. I don't mean party political, but I do think there is great strength and security in uh, local human rights activists, defenders, having some sort of political clout, political power. Um, I think, you know, when the attacks on organizations for being foreign agents or, or, or for being foreign funded organizations, I mean, I'm oversimplifying here, but certainly I think that mud stuck against some uh, in some countries because it looked pretty true to people. Uh, there were local organizations who really didn't have 
uh, many local roots or, or local ties and appeared to be really working to uh, an international funding agenda. And I think that when they looked for local political support, it, it, it wasn't there because they hadn't really invested in it for years. And those which, again, I'm overgeneralizing here, but I can think of examples. I don't want to name names here, certainly. But, I, but you know, when you, when you look at organizations which are rooted locally, it's just more difficult to knock those over uh, than it is where there's going to be no political consequence locally. So, I, you know, I try and advise as much as it's ever my position to advise local human rights defenders to really build their local networks. And we can call them political or not, but to build those local networks um, uh, as thoroughly as they can, because in the end, that's what's going to protect them more than the having foreign friends. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else on the panel? Yes, Mikhail. Yeah, I would just note, I think, sort of complementary to Brian's point that we have seen our partners sometimes when the environment at the national level is quite hostile to engaging in advocacy or pushing for positive reform, that there may be openings at the municipal or regional level within countries, which often more locally based organizations can take advantage of. You, you know, there's often significant heterogeneity among municipalities and among regions in terms of how sort of adverse or welcoming they are of working with civil society. And it may also be easier in some instances to find areas of commonality and possible progress. For instance, partners in Colombia in the last couple of years have, have made progress in working with municipalities on developing protest protocols to manage to, to, to sort of facilitate management of protests and facilitate the conduct of protests. And I think that comes from the fact that at the municipal level, in many cases, there actually is an interest in trying to ensure that protests can occur with a minimum of disorder, with a minimum of conflict. Not in all municipalities, certainly, but on a case-by-case -case basis, there may be openings for that, or openings to push, for example, for um, more, uh, more thoughtful application of registration requirements or funding requirements or requirements to get authorization, um, appro official approval of CSO activities. Uh, so I think local organizations can often engage more effectively with their local governments and there may be openings in those cases. Um, any other thoughts, Tine, on this? Any comments on this or? And I think it's it's really um, how it's, it's really important to for for, your, for international NGOs to have a menu of um, the 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 things that they can the added value <laughs> uh, the things that they can do to help uh, local civil society. You know? But at the end of the day, uh, much of what uh, needs to be employed uh, among the tactics uh, should be determined by those at the local level because at the end of the day you know uh, uh, they are the ones facing uh, the consequences whether this be reprisals or you know um, uh, advantages you know, uh, for in, in relation to this um, um, support from international organizations at the same time, of course, it's a lot more different uh, with organizations painted as foreign agents. No, uh, they have a more um, they they are more stigmatized on the ground, both by by I think both by civil society and by by the government. There's some, of course, there's some uh, what's this hesitation also from local uh, organ community organizations, especially when when they don't know. Uh, the track record of uh, these international organizations, um, but you know it, uh, it's it's not so pronounced yet in the Philippines. But at the same time, uh, even at the national level, um, we we are quite aware you know, uh, of how uh, this should be a broader conversation with many international organizations. Thank you. The next question has to do with uh, the shrinking of uh, um, civic spaces and the extent to which this shrinkage creates opportunities for new spaces 
uh, as a way of counter navigating the shrinking of existing spaces. Thoughts? Yes, Philippe. We'll follow the same order. And I think, um, I think it can push more people to realize that they live under a repressive regime and that they, you know, uh, the freedom to think they may have their own, uh, the future of the children, etc. So in a way, it, it can have positive effects, in particular, maybe helping to sway uh, the general population in a more progressive di direction. However, when you've got a, and we come back here to social media, etc., but when you have an endoctrinement of society uh, and very sophisticated uh, media apparatus and you know, ways of subsidizing life and etc. That that makes people think along with the regime, the incumbent regime. Then it's hard to get out of it. Uh, yeah. Uh, the the second one, of course, is uh, building on, on on what Brian was talking about at the very beginning. Is that under these very restrictive uh, civic spaces, there are indeed lots of ways to organize, etc. Uh, the you know the the kitchen table as we used to call it uh, you, you know and, and you've got discrete meetings etc but this is uh, you know uh, when you've got the two system where you know small bands uh, tend to unite together and it's very restrictive and and compared to that you've got a social media that is dominating and media and jobs etc is dominated it's a very uneven playing field uh, so i'm not quite sure uh, you know th this this is uh, quite promising that's that, for me that's why we need to have a strong uh, regulation of uh, of social media that is progressive so we need more uh, you know uh, a tight end social media space, especially getting all the trolls out and all the you know fake stuff that is being circulated by 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 government. Uh, but but that's difficult. Yeah, that's difficult. Gotcha. I, I know some companies are working on that. You know how intelligence, artificial intelligence, can do fact checking the, the, that you have genuine accounts that you really hear. You know it's a, it's bringing back democracy because otherwise what you have is an authoritarian uh, social space uh, that is really like Big Brother. Uh, and it's terrifying uh, because even experts get the information wrong sometimes. Yeah, they get the experts get often their information. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Anyhow, thank you, Philippe. Um, anybody else from the panel? Any thoughts on this? And just to offer mine, George. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, well. Uh, many from the martial law generation uh, during the time of the dictatorship, whenever this thing comes out, a uh, new space, uh, they would offer uh, the, their experience that, you know, they lived in a, under martial law, under a dictatorship, and they, 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 they still had um, the so-called space, uh, some may call it the underground or <laughs> Uh, the under the radar uh, movements, as um, uh, Philip has said, no, but but it's true. It's it's a thing that we're looking at. We have been looking at it since the time they came into power, no. And if um, another Marcos comes in, you know, uh, many survived martial law because of uh, you know going underground, and uh, I guess that's the situation also in Myanmar right now. No, doesn't mean that civil societies. Um, silent. No? It's just that uh, it's it's uh, the the organ organizing can work better uh, in this kind of you know uh, venue. But at the same time, uh, look when we look at the elections right now, when we here in the Philippines look at uh, the new areas, uh, we are currently um, maximizing what we call the pink electorate, <laughs> a different pink. Here because it's the campaign caller of the uh, vice presidential candidate who's running, mm -hmm. who's contending with Marcos Jr. You know, and uh, she uses the color pink to uh, as a symbol of her campaign. And there were so many uh, big rallies. Many of these pink crowds are middle class, you know? but at the same time, it definitely 
goes to show that there are more people who are more involved, no? Other than those who are just on social media before or, you know, you're joining the rallies. I think these electoral movements uh, are important for us, no? In, in building and strengthening our movements more. So that's a space, you know, that has opened for us, um, especially during this election. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Tine, any other thoughts on this from any other panelists before we proceed with the next question? Okay, the next question, the Ukraine moment. All right, so has it made easier for human rights defenders to raise awareness in other countries because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Or are human rights issues are rendered more difficult to notice, less visible as a result of Russia's actions in the Ukraine. Thoughts, comments? Yes, Philippe. Sorry, yes. And I don't want to monopolize, huh? please. I just feel the void. Uh, my sense is, well, you know, you know the slogan, this is what democracy looks like. Well, it looks like, you know, this is what autoc dangerous militaristic autocracy looks like, you know, oil funded and all the rest. So for people like us, we've worked a lot on, you know, what we call petro aggression. This is really a, a school case. It's incredible. Uh, so I think it, it really reminds people that, yeah, you know, uh, it, it's all good and nice, this kind of patriotic, populist authoritarianism, but look at where it's leading you. So that's on one side. The second side, I think, unfortunately, it is leading to also some forms of polarization. And we are seeing in recent days, you know, Ukrainian people putting people in jail, you know, for, you know, like supporting kind of Russia staff and uh, Russia's perspective. And we've seen RT coming offline, et cetera. So we're into this kind of anti-propaganda uh, moment where we could be a little bit like into the anti-terrorist movement, but this time extended to the social media sphere, et cetera. And I think this is a little bit dangerous to be frank. Um, so it could be a slippery slope. Um, so that's, that's my main point. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you, Philippe. Anybody else from the panel? Um, I'm happy to uh, say something about this, although my internet has just become pretty flaky. Uh, so sorry if um, uh, if it breaks up. Um, <clears throat> I think there are some advantages in terms of the just, you know, from what I see in Western Europe, at least uh, the blanket media coverage of what's happening in that. You know, I, I mean, it, it, it's it's been more or less apart from the Oscars that that night, the lead <laughs> item on the news for, you know, near enough a month now and I suppose much of what's being described can legitimately to be described as human rights stories um, particularly the the IDP and refugee movements uh, into Western Europe and I think um, I mean it, of course those are tragic things but what I'm what I'm the point I'm trying to make is that 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 there are human rights stories now on mainstream media all the time uh, in Western Europe and people I suppose are having discussions about some of these issues particularly around let's say refugee rights war crimes is now you know more of a conversation than it was three months ago uh, so some people are getting educated I guess um, about what some of these things mean not least around the double standards in terms of the um, the acceptance or the welcoming of refugees uh, by some Western European and, and some other countries compared to, say, what happened with Syria uh, or Afghanistan or the coverage, again, again compared to what we see in the coverage um, around Ukraine compared to the coverage that we've seen over Yemen. And I don't think I'm being overly optimistic here, but I think there are some, you know, some useful positive conversations which are likely uh, to have good outcomes out of that. Um, but uh, it's too early to say yet. I mean, I do think that 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 I'm surprised, frankly, as I say, I was I was in on Ukraine and, and Poland last week, and I really was surprised at the extent of the welcome uh, and the number of volunteers on the Polish side of the border who were helping uh, people. 
uh, compared to um, a few months before that, I was on, on the Poland-Belarus border and uh, the Polish government and much of Polish society not a least bit welcome uh, to those people who've come from, from the Middle East and elsewhere via uh, Belarus and into Poland. So again, that, that, that double standards, um, I think, is throwing up some, <laughs> some useful conversations, yeah. Any other thoughts? Okay, we're approaching the end of the session. So by way of conclusion, may I ask you if I can quickly follow up on this question and offer a counterpoint to Brian's optimism, which of course I welcome. It's important to be optimistic. But what if also this turns out the Russian invasion of Ukraine to be another 9-11 moment in which we see for example, the U.S. increasingly embracing regimes irrespective of their human rights performance domestically simply in order to keep a united front against Russia. Examples of that, embracing of Poland, embracing of Hungary, when Poland, for example, was sanctioned by the European Union for eroding the rule of law and uh, denying them funds because of their attack on judges. Now the European Union is releasing the funds because they need Poland to be on the side of the US in the anti-Russian bloc. Hungary is in being embraced. Let me remind you, Hungary was not invited in the summit of democracies, nor Turkey. If the summit of democracies were to be held today, I'm not sure whether Biden would invite Turkey and Hungary to the party. Embracing Maduro in Venezuela, what are the implications there for human rights defenders in Venezuela, in Poland, in Hungary, that are trying to defend their space for action? Very quickly, if you have some thoughts of that, because I think this is something we should seriously be concerned about. Philippe. Well, yeah, I mean, war tend to favor incumbents generally, uh, both domestically and in international relations. Um, uh, unless, of course, you're the target, like Saddam Hussein was. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, otherwise, yeah, essentially, you're going to have a lot of pragmatic strategic alliances and uh, the overall picture may not be that great. In the long term, however, you know, many progressive social movements have come out of war situations and people have valued their rights, uh, freedom of expression, the importance of truth, etc. And it's very possible that after the, this current crisis, if we've got a positive outcome in Russia, they will have some major rethought because if they go through two or three years of the North Korean regime, uh, maybe, you know, a society that was very developed and used to spend their holidays in the Balears, uh, for some of them, and quite a large middle class was doing that, uh, they're going to have to think seriously about, you know, where, where they want to be heading. So I'm not holding my breath on that one, but I'm saying it's maybe one positive thing that could come out, but certainly not like tomorrow morning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And yes, Nikki. Yeah, the only point I would add to that is I think that the, the Russian invasion has been helpful and to some extent dispelling this growing myth or appearance of authoritarian invincibility or authoritarian fallibility, mm -hmm. which I, I think that over the last two decades in the Western world, there has come to be um, a, a sense that perhaps democracy is not effective in structuring um, efficient societies and that autocracy is somehow better at doing that. And I think the sort of um, weakness of the Russian armed forces and the, the, the clear um, uh, inability of Russia to sort of prosecute its strategic priorities in this invasion have helped to undermine that myth that somehow authoritarian governments are effective at governance, whereas democratic governments struggle. And that is incredibly effective. That's incredibly helpful, I think. Um, because I, I do think that with time we are coming to, and I think part of the reason that we are seeing more legislation targeting civil society, more legislation undermining human rights, is that to some extent, including in established democracies, we have come to forget some of the benefits of democracies in terms of getting responsive and effective governance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other 
last minute thoughts from yeah uh, panel. yes yeah very quickly i i uh, accept the logic of what you're saying there george in terms of um you know nothing might matter like six months from now other than we're back to an old sort of cold warish as long as you're against russia you're okay with the us type scenario but frankly that's not pretty that's you know the us has a very very high threshold in terms of um its comfort level with being allied with dictatorships i mean i, I mentioned earlier on the arab uprisings the us has, has done nothing to help civil society uh, in many of those countries since. And it, it's more than happy to be allied with the dictatorships of Egypt and Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates while they've been waging war against Yemen, Bahrain and some of these others. Uh, in fact, you know, the shift it's done is to be selling these places more weapons. I don't think the Russian invasion is going to change that mindset. It may switch, a, although I, I would say on Hungary, actually, I think that Orban is under more international scrutiny now of his support for Putin over the last few years than he has been before. Uh, so might the US be less um, inclined to pressure governments to become more democratic? Maybe, but they've done such a terrible job of doing that in the Middle East anyway. Like, yeah. That, that okay. wouldn't be a changing mindset for them. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. Um, uh, I, I obviously could go on and apologies for those um, who, whose questions we did not address. But we could go on and on, but we need to bring it to an end. I don't know about you folks, but I need desperately a glass of wine at this stage, you know, if you, and I'm sure you can all sympathize with that. <laughs> Anyhow, but on a more serious note, I want to thank again uh, our panelists, uh, Tini, uh, Philippe, Brian, and Nikhil, for their very thoughtful. Uh, presentations, as well as the insightful way in which they address our queries and comments during Q&A. All of you for being with us this evening and staying with us till the very end. And our team again at the Human Rights Hub, uh, Meryl, uh, Juan, Isabella, and Juan, for all their work in making this event possible. And please stay tuned. Actually, Mary, can we put the on the chat the, the web info for the Human Rights Hub? Uh, if we could do that, please log into our website so that uh, you can keep up to date on other activities that will be forthcoming. We're very excited about this initiative, thank you, Meryl, and this is just the beginning. Thanks again. Have a nice evening. Have a nice afternoon. Or for you, Tini, have a nice breakfast. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank all. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay. I'll sign off here. Yeah, okay, sure. Uh, Mary, when he's ready, please send me the link, okay? Because I would oh, like, yeah, yeah when, when, the, when it is ready, because I would like to.